This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Eldridge, welcome to Eldridge and Company. First as a legal aid attorney, Sarah Bennett fought wrongful convictions. And then as a mother, she wrote a book and challenged homework. Now a few weeks ago, there was a cover story in the New York Times Magazine section identifying her as the attorney for Judith Clark, an inmate at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. Sarah and I share interest in her story, and she is my guest today. Hi, Ronnie. Hi. So, what is our interest in Judy Clark, and why did somebody write a magazine story about her? I'll let you explain it, since some people may not know. Okay. So Judy is a woman who's serving a 75-year sentence in prison, meaning that she will never come out of prison until 75 years has passed. So since she went in when she was 30, you know, she'll be 107 years old before she's eligible per, for parole. My interest in her, and I think most people's, is it's many-leveled. One, um, she was part of, do you want me to describe the crime? Or, Just, nah. yeah, yeah. I mean, she was part of a big crime and she was a getaway driver. She was unarmed. She wasn't actually at the precise scene where the shooting took place. She got a 75 year sentence because she did not defend herself in court. She was actually in the basement of the courthouse while the trial was going on. It was a, so it was connected to a radical movement. It was connected to a radical movement that was really an offshoot, a very late offshoot of the Weather Underground. Mm -hmm. Many of Judy's co-defendants either um, defended themselves at trial and they had very good defense attorneys and so were not convicted of being the shooters and they got very short sentences, some of them as little as six years in prison. The person who was considered to be the mastermind will be out of prison in about four years. And so Judy, who was a very secondary member of that whole crime, and it probably had at least 20 people, maybe more, who were associated with, is one of the last people remaining in prison. What interests me most about because Judy... Because she didn't have a counsel. Because she didn't have counsel, she didn't defend herself, and the judge gave her the maximum that he could, and he said, I don't think this woman will ever be rehabilitated. And quite frankly, at the time, who knew where she would go? I mean, she made a complete mockery of his courtroom in the few minutes that she was in there, and she was always, you know, saying things like "free the land," and I don't, I don't um, recognize, I don't recognize this court. And yeah. so, the fact that he gave her 75 years was probably not that astonishing at the time. But when you fast forward 30 years and you see where her co-defendants are, and you see who she has become. That's what, really that's what interests me, Ronnie. And I actually stopped practicing criminal law almost eight years ago now. I said I would never, ever And when you practice law, you didn't only do appeals of wrongful conviction. No, actually that was a very small portion. Yeah. I had a lot of battered women clients um, and a lot of people who were just guilty. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> people came to me and asked me to represent Judy and one of the reasons I ultimately decided to do it is because she had had such an amazing impact on my women clients in Bedford Hills, who I don't know how many I had over the years, but you know, a few dozen. And Judy's name would almost always come up as this incredible woman. And so when people came to me and said, well, you represent Judy, I said, oh, let me think about it. And that's, and that's what happened. That's what happened. So now, how do we represent her? What are you representing her for? Well, her only hope of ever getting out of prison is clemency from a governor, the governor of the state of New York. She's not eligible for a presidential par pardon, which people think she is. She's not eligible. There's nothing she can do in a courtroom. So the only person who will ever, who has the power to let her go is a governor. And when they grant clemency, it's not saying, I pardon you. It's just saying, you know, I recognize that you are an extraordinary person for whatever reason. And I am going to allow you to go and see a parole board, and a parole board will make a decision about whether or not to <coughs> let you go. And, um, you know, you have to realize that there aren't many people serving life sentences, which is what Judy has, 
for being a member of a secondary team in a felony, felony murder. I have a whole other question mm -hmm. about really what, what's the purpose of putting people right. in prison? Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I think we've, it, it's really, where, is it warehousing people? Just well, I for think as long as they're sentenced. I think we go through waves in criminal justice. Sometimes it's about rehabilitation, and sometimes it's about warehousing. I think in New York State, which um, tried to institute a death penalty and then has a life without parole, it has become more about warehousing, and it's a big, expensive problem for the state of New York. So, if nothing else, yeah, it makes you sense know, to get some people out. It does make sense, but it makes sense for somebody especially in Judy's case. I mean, there were probably other Judys in New York State, but I'm not sure there's actually a Judy. There are other people who are... Well, what has she done that. in prison that's really... Uh, She's done everything. There's so many different levels. First of all, you have to look at her, her own personal transformation. She is such a wise woman who has really dealt with her own involvement in a really horrible crime. And, and I think that's what draws people to her. And she recognizes and what she did. She recognizes it. She's incredibly remorseful. She takes responsibility for it. If she could be involved in victim offender dialogue, she would do it in a heartbeat, but she's not allowed to reach out to the victims. That's a, you know, one aspect of the way New York State works, so that a defendant can never reach out to the victims, although the victims could reach out to her. So there's that aspect of her that she is so good at helping her fellow prisoners take responsibility for themselves and what they have done and how to build a life. And it's incredibly inspiring to the women on the inside. Mm. And that, I think, is, I don't know what is Judy's crowning achievement, but I think that that is one of them. Now, she's built or been part of building all kinds of programs in Bedford from, um, in the early days, Bedford Hills was one of the first facilities to deal with the AIDS problem. And she was part of a group that sort of um, developed a way, sort of a peer counseling that was then replicated in all the prisons throughout the country. The country. Yeah. Um, when funding for colleges was um, disbanded, the college, program, the the college program in the prison, she was the person with a, a group, again, who got college professors to come in and build up this very vivid and vibrant um, college program in the prison and a couple hundred women have um, gotten, degrees. gotten degrees. I think what she loves most of all is her work in the nursery and um, Bedford Hills takes in women who are pregnant, um, who, are, who are sentenced to, when they're pregnant, right? Yeah. They all come to Bedford yeah. Hills even though it's a maximum security prison so ordinarily they may go somewhere else and they actually have a nursery program where they are on the, you know, the women keep the babies with them up until 18 months and she's developed all kinds of parenting programs and that, you know, so it's part of breaking that cycle of violence that she's really a big part of and how to be a good parent and, and she's been an amazing parent to her own daughter. So really, she, she's the prime example of what prison should be, rehabilitation. And they used to call them penitentiaries, mm -hmm. right? Because people went, th were sent mm -hmm. there to do penance? Right. And that's basically her story. That's basically her story. I mean, she's, she herself is so incredibly rehabilitated, but I think that she's a model to other people, yeah. you know, and, and one, of the th one of the reasons clemency is so important is it's, it's incredibly demoralizing for the other people in the system That's to right. see somebody like her who, you know, I mean, the New York Times Magazine kind of went into it, but she has the support of the former superintendent of the prison, of the former commissioner of parole under um, George Pataki, Governor Pataki. She has, you Correction know, officers corrections office, officers. When I go to that prison, I mean, Ronnie, the I went into that prison the, for... The priest who's there, everybody. Everybody, but I went yeah. in that prison for 20 years, and the way I am treated as her lawyer yeah. is completely different than anything I've ever experienced. Oh, you're here for Judy. She doesn't belong here. I hope you're going to get her out. I wish I could say something. I mean, it's just, incredible. it's incredible. And when she comes into the, the, the visiting room, she stops at everybody yeah. to say hello to everybody and, and cheers them up, and it's an amazing <laughs> scene. But it's, um, when you said it's demoralizing, you know, when I worked for Governor Cuomo, mm -hmm. the first Governor Cuomo, uh, I was very active at Bedford Hills, and, and we help people with their clemency appeals. Mm -hmm. and, 
everybody, they write them and they spend a lot of time and they contact people and they get all kinds of references and then everybody's waiting for mm -hmm. that Christmas season. Mm -hmm. And then when there aren't any, and that happens mm -hmm. years, it's, it is. It's not what becomes the motivation then to try to answer all the questions that we demand of prisoners to return them to society. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, I think the motivation is really about creating your own life in prison. I think that's really what you have to do as a prisoner if you really want to have a full life. I do think that um, clemency is a completely underused power. I mean, it's really, it's such an amazing power that a governor has, and a president also. And, um, you know, in New York State, I don't think it's barely been used since Governor Kerry. I think he was the last one mm -hmm. who really did it. And He was I, also the last one who refused to execute it, the first one to yeah, execute anybody. But, um, you know, we just saw Haley Barber use his power. Right. And, you know, it got a lot of play one way or the other, but I thought it was actually really exciting. He thought about who he was giving his clemencies to. It wasn't like he went out and pulled them out of a a right. bag. He actually had a whole procedure set up the way New York State does, where there's a clemency bureau that actually evaluates people. Um, you know, there's a t point in everybody's lives where they do change, and I really don't think that Especially you, under the circumstances yeah. they're living on. Yeah. And you know, when he took all the heat because he, he pardoned all these, mm -hmm. not a pardon, clemency? Clemency. Or did he pardon? He did both. Yeah. The people who worked in the mansion. Mm -hmm. But those are the people who are most trusted in the system. Of course, and those are the people <laughs> they actually knew. Right. You know, I mean, that's the thing. I, you could go into any prison and ask the superintendent or the warden, who do you think doesn't belong here anymore? And I'm sure you, they could give you a long list. And that would be a great place to start, wouldn't it? Would, it? it would be very interesting, especially people serving long terms mm -hmm. and people who are old. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have older prisoners who've been there sentenced to 25 to life who don't somehow get past parole, mm -hmm. and who, um, what is the point of keeping them there once you're older? Well, I don't know. I think it's going to be a big fiscal problem in New York State because we have a lot of prisoners who, I, I don't have the numbers, but there are a lot of people who are over the age of 50 or 55. You know, anybody in criminal justice will tell you there's a certain age at which crime is very minimal. You know, it's around the age of 30 or something like that. So the expense of keeping people in prison is just, it's enormous. And, you know, there's health problems and... You have to provide you know, the medical you care. You have to provide the medical there care. There are the broken it's, families, it's, yeah. people who've been waiting and everything else and trying to do everything. Mm -hmm. The parole system in New York, too, seems to have tightened up, I think. The people coming yeah. before the parole board. Now, we're not talking about younger people because there's a difference, isn't there, in mm -hmm. the ages of who comes into the system and, mm -hmm. and who, who stays in. Uh -huh. We're not talking about young people who are coming in with drugs or something like that. No, because New York State used to have an indeterminate sentencing set, um, system, meaning that you would get a sentence of, uh, you know, eight and a third to 25 or 12 and a half to 25 or something like that. And then you would come up for parole at that minimum, eight and a third or 12 and a half. And then the parole board could decide whether or not to let you go. Now we have what's called determinant sentencing. And most people have that. So if you have a 12 year oh, sentence, you know that you're going to get out at six sevenths of 12, whatever that might be. So a lot of people You don't are, have to get out though. No, you do. Oh, you do? You do, under determinant sentencing. So the people who are staying in are the people who have life on the end. 15 to life, 25 to life. Oh, and when I first started practicing law in 1986, typically if you had 15 to life or 20 to life and you came up to the parole board, you, you got released. If you had done a good job in prison, you got released. But that changed somewhere around 1996. I'm not sure where it came from, but it changed. And so now if you have 15 to life, you go to the parole board at 15 and they give you what's called a two-year hit. And you go back at 17 and 19 and 21 and 23 and 25 and 27 and you keep on, you, the parole board doesn't let you go. And so, I think and even though you've been, you know, a yeah. completely perfect prisoner for all that time. And I think, <coughs> I think, I don't know if parole commissioners are afraid to let people go. It's too weighty of a thing. I'm not really sure why. Uh, who's, the, who's on the parole board? Uh, are they appointed by the governor? I think they are. 
Yeah. So they're responsible. They're responsible, just, it's yeah. It's just an appointee job. Yeah, it is an appointee job. And they usually have some kind of a background. No? In criminal justice, yeah. usually, yeah. yeah. Are well, they, do we know if it's balanced between law enforcement and... Oh, I think it's most, it's mostly law enforcement. I think they mostly come out of being um, parole commissioners. Right. I think there used to be a rate of granting like 55% uh -huh. of the people who were eligible, mm -hmm. and now I think it's down to like 25%. Yeah, it's it's not a good system. Yeah. It's not. But the problem is so interesting to me because the younger people who go into prison, their major problem is recidivism. Mm -hmm. And our major problem is how, when they come out of a prison, do we provide those community mm -hmm. services for them? Mm -hmm. And then here we have the other way, right. which is, uh, it's too bad. So what's your next step? Oh, that's that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it, because it's only it's a one person. It's the governor who has to decide that he wants to do it, and I, you know, I have to believe, and I think this is the only way I actually am able to do this. Is there's a part of me that believes that people do what's right because it's right, and and for no other reason, you know, because it's never really. Um, in anybody's interest to do anything with criminal justice because there's always a furor around criminal justice so right. why not just maintain the status quo I think that's the easiest thing to do but there's a part of me that has to believe that this governor who's pretty I mean he's a very strong governor mm. and he has a very strong will and strong opinions and there's a part of me that just thinks when he reads this petition and he understands everything about it and really looks at it and I guess I didn't say this but we know in our minds, really, any person who works within the system, what that crime was actually worth. You know, if you mm -hmm. want to say, mm -hmm. how much was it worth? It was worth 20 years to life. Because that's what Judy's co-defendant, mm -hmm. Kathy Boudin, got. She was allowed to plead guilty, and she got 20 years to life. Judy's role, if anything, was a little more minimal than Kathy's. So had Judy played the system at the same time as Kathy, she would have gotten 20 to life. So... You know, as a defense attorney, I'm a little offended by the idea of being punished for going to trial by an extra it, it, 55 years. It's not years, changing you know. a jury verdict. No, it's not changing a verdict. Absolutely it's perfectly not. Perfectly just a, ju a judge's no, it's judgment. Just, it's, it's just a sentencing thing. Uh -huh. And I actually believe had, had Judy way back then had a lawyer either at trial or, or let's say on appeal, had I been her appellate lawyer, because that's what I did, and I saw that she had a 75-year to life sentence and her co-defendant had 20 years I would have argued in the appellate division she got an extra 55 years for going to trial she was punished for exercising her constitutional right to a trial and I believe that yeah. an appellate court would have agreed with me but she didn't file an appeal she didn't participate in the system so she's paying 30 years later mm -hmm. for very very bad choices she made not only to participate in a crime, I mean, that was ridiculous, but also to forego any kind of legal yeah. counsel. That is too bad. That's really... Yeah. Um, what made you become a lawyer? Oh, I don't know. I wanted to save the world, <laughs> I guess, and I thought that might be a good place to do it. That's a, uh, there are people who want to save the world. Yeah. I like to yeah. feel that yeah. I'm kind of like that or change the, yeah. change the world. Um, you, but you represented some people or maybe very few people who, who you won mm -hmm. and got them out, but then something happened. <laughs> and that, does that discourage you when people are guilty and you're defending them? You know, I actually had a really pretty great success rate with my yeah. battered women clients, yeah. which was really well, they were very fab. It was very specific and it was very wonderful. Um, if you had, but you believed, I mean, you really believed in them and you felt that. If you were representing somebody who, who was, as you said earlier, guilty, guilty uh -huh. But you still could do it because you believe they had they deserved representation. Is yeah, that what yeah. And then then it's different. It's a little yeah. more intellectual. It's it's about constitutional rights. It's about a fair trial. It's it's just about making sure in a way that the system works. And in some ways, representing Judy is about is the system working or not. And so far, for it's, I don't think it's working. That's so interesting. So when you took your vacation between mm -hmm. legal aid and Judy. Mm -hmm. You then took on a totally unrelated mm -hmm. project. Uh -huh. And what were you doing? You're trying to save the children. <laughs> yeah. I actually wrote a book called The Case Against Homework. Um, I was just really bothered by the amount of homework that 
kids were doing and I started to do a little research and I found out that there was actually no correlation between homework and academic achievement. But that was kind but of... You have two kids, so I you do. were watching it. Yeah, I was. But I was that, that fact was kind of buried in education research. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought, oh, if I brought this to the public four, then parents would stop complaining about homework and actually step up for their kids and say, you know, my kids need a life besides working all the time. And so that's why it was a real... It wasn't actually as much of a stretch from criminal law to education as you might think. Connect them. Well, they're both about um, people who don't have the power to speak for themselves, really. You know, Interesting. You know, children, children rely on their parents to <clears throat> make life fair for them. And little children, <clears throat> excuse me, little children in particular, to come home from school and to do a lot of work and to start having fights with their parents and, you know, really negative interactions over something that has been shown to have no value. It just really, really bothered me. So and what was the reaction? Well, I think the reaction was actually pretty good, yeah. you know? I mean, there's now a film called The Race to Nowhere, which a lot of people have heard yeah. about. But yeah. my book was featured everywhere. I was pretty much on every, you know, all those morning shows yeah. and pretty much every newspaper magazine covered the whole idea. I mean, it's not a f way out there idea that kids need downtime they need to play they need to dream they need to think you know we're so stuck in this uh, culture of testing and competition competition but mostly testing and we've really forgotten what education is about which is about a love of learning right right so and so you but somebody called you and offered you one and gave you the opportunity to form a little an organization? I did, yes. They offered you money. <laughs> yeah, somebody, there was like a fairy godmother came down and said, I really like what you're doing and I will fund you. And I, so I started uh, a <laughs> small nonprofit called Stop Homework, which was affiliated with the Alliance for Childhood. And it was really about encouraging parents to advocate for themselves and their children and also many teachers who knew that what they were imposing on, especially anybody who is in um, early elementary education mm -hmm. because those are the those are the teachers who really go in because they mm -hmm. they love kids you know and they know that it's really not healthy what we're doing to young children so and this the public the new york public school system mm -hmm. with all the demands on principals mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. teachers um, it makes it very difficult for parents to communicate doesn't it with the schools it does well you know new york city has so many different kinds of schools it's almost impossible to talk about New York City schools mm -hmm. is one monolith because you have like the really poor schools and then you have the really high achieving schools and there is no comparison. There, I mean, they're like two completely different entities and the kind of access you're going to have in those schools is completely different and, you know, some of the schools have, some of the schools have scripted learning. Do you know that? Where the what teachers go mean? in, they actually have a script right. and all the teachers have to be teaching the exact same thing with the same wording at the exact the same, same time, time every day. That's what goes on in the very poor schools in New York City. And then you have a There's school... not much success. No, with probably... Well, what, you would think they would change the program. I mean, I always said that <laughs> it, was, it was poor kids who needed to have, you know, the, the, the free-forming, yeah. you know, beautiful schools that the wealthier kids get to go to, where there is time to daydream and play with, you know, mm. play at the water table and all of those kinds of things. And, and the kids in um, high-performing schools are not... They're not taking tests. They're not... You know, there's certain high schools that are not regents based, for instance. But you know, you're not gonna find a poor school where the kids don't and, have to take regents. And a lot of those good schools have all that parental involvement. Exactly. And that also separates, right? right the right, people exactly. who have all these opportunities uh, and got, the people who have you, no opportunities. Exactly. It's the same as practicing legal aid lawyering. It, it's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So um, And a lot of my clients come out of those very poor schools, yeah. you know, and they actually got their education in prison and they ran across the Judy Clark who then took them under their wing and, and you made know. life more so, beautiful. Yeah, so you see that's that's the connection. Yeah. I love the cover because you see this big heavy yeah. bag yeah. <laughs> and loaded down. And it's um did you have success? I mean do you think you changed some of the schools? I do. I do. There are across the country there are certain school districts that have imposed limits on homework. There were, you know, certain schools where they eliminated homework for K through five. Um, yeah. It's yeah. essentially so unfair to have homework because especially when you compare the poor schools with 
that mm -hmm. you're saying the low performing schools, which tend to have the poorer children in them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so, and that would mean that they have less opportunity at home because well, the they parents don't have, right, are they don't, not as well educated exactly. or as. I mean, it's not like cheery people, about life. I'm not anti-education, <laughs> obviously. Yes. I mean, I'm all for kids going home and reading as much as possible. But to sit there and do more worksheets, like the kind they've done at school, to go home and do them for no apparent value, is just it, it just bothers me. So you're married to a photographer. I am. Your son is a musician. Yes. And your daughter, who's just graduating from um, high school. Edward R. Morrow uh -huh. High School, a public high school, mm -hmm. is an artist. Right. And that, so I think that that shows us that you're very successful. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and your thing. And that I hope that um, it's going to wear off on Judy, too. Oh, I, ho I hope so. Or on the so. governor or so. somebody. If somebody has a really good idea, do you have, you have a, a website? I do. Anybody who has a good idea, it's judithclark.org. And, and learn, they also can how, learn more about Judy. They can more, learn more about Judy. They can write letters to the governor. They can, um, where we have these little buttons that just say, ask me about Judy Clark, and people can yeah. then learn about her. I mean, it's really, it's a, you know, it's just important. People ask me, like, why is she so important? But the, the fact is, is that she's important because she stands for something that is beautiful. Really. And, make, and, and yeah. change the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Forgiveness. Forgiveness, redemption. <laughs> she, well, I feel very privileged to have met you, and I met you in this Around this, this I feel right. privileged to meet you, Ronnie. It's <laughs> so been it wonderful. was very good. Thank you very much, Thank Sarah you. Bennett. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.